Hello, everybody. We'll just give it another 30 seconds or so to allow people to arrive slightly late, and then we'll get going. Welcome. And just so that everybody know they're in the right place, this is indeed the talk whose title is on the slide in front of you. Well, given that um, I'll be saying a few things before we start, people can probably join while I'm talking, so we might as well get going. So first of all, good afternoon slash good evening and welcome everybody and happy new year. This talk is going to be by Professor Nathan Hill of Trinity College Dublin, whose title is The Word for Tiger in Chinese and Other Asian Languages. And as you probably know, this talk is organised as part of the Dublin Lunar New Year Festival. So what's going on? Why is there a Lunar New Year happening? So lunar years are different from our calendar, which is why the 1st of January is where we start, but lunar years start slightly differently. And the date of the first lunar year varies from year to year. So it's the first new moon between the 21st of January and the 20th of February. So it's going to be tomorrow, I think, that the lunar year starts. And lunar year is of incredible cultural importance across Asia. And traditionally, the years are associated with animals in the Chinese tradition, so that we're about to enter in 2022, the year of the tiger. Now, this is of great interest for lots of reasons, partly to do with the rich cultural universe of Asia, and partly because this throws up related questions, such as the meaning of words, which people are always fascinated by. So why is it the year of the tiger? And more importantly for this talk, where does the word tiger itself come from in the languages of Asia? And this is where we're very lucky to be able to draw on the expertise of Professor Nathan Hill, who did his PhD at Harvard University uh, in 2009, then joined the School of Oriental and African Studies, where he was head of department, leader of an ERC grant, and a prolific publisher on the historical linguistics and related subjects of the languages of Asia. He edited, uh, co-edited this book called The Evidential Systems of Tibetan Languages, and you can see here the table of contents that gives you an idea of the breadth of topics which get included in a subject like this. And in 2019, he authored another of his sole authored monographs, and I've taken a random shot of the table of contents here, or part of it, that tells us about tight pre-initials and loose pre-initials. We'll have to ask him about that at the end of the talk. He is currently the Professor of Chinese Studies at Trinity College Dublin, and also the Director of the Trinity Centre for Asian Studies. So I would ask you to join me in welcoming him, and at the end of his talk, there will be an opportunity for questions. Please do not type your questions in the chat but rather put them in the uh, prescribed Q&A function. Thank you very much to all of you coming. Professor Hill, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Martin, for this kind introduction. And now I will uh, share my presentation and we hope everything uh, works well. Is this, is this working? Yeah, okay. So um, yes, so I am uh, going to tell you about the word for tiger. Let me just move this bar here. Uh, and um, this is uh, on the screen in front of you, the character, the Chinese character for tiger uh, in the oldest variety of um, the Chinese script that we, we have, uh, the oracle bone inscriptions from the Shang dynasty, about 1250 BCE. And you see that it looks uh, rather like a tiger sort of turned on its side, yeah? Sorry, just a second. Uh, oh, so, and then here is uh, the character, as you know, today uh, in the traditional uh, script. Uh, so that, you know, I, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but uh, that is a historically continuous, uh, especially as uh, you you write with a brush, then the, the rather than inscribe in a, in a, in a, in a bone, uh, the image has changed. So that's what the character looks like. Um, now about how it was pronounced. So uh, it was, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So in today's uh, Mandarin uh, Chinese, it's hu in the third tone. And the first uh, form of Chinese that we have systematically attested is from a, a dictionary from 602 
that, that gives uh, the pronunciation of um, thousands of different characters. It gives those pronunciations in other Chinese characters. So it takes some bit of interpreting uh, to figure out what's going on. And I'm not going to describe that uh, in, in any detail, uh, but uh, th you, there is a way to romanize it where you're capturing exactly that information that's in this dictionary from 602. Uh, and I've written here the character the character's pronunciation in a, a romanization system by a guy named Bill Baxter. So uh, the, the capital X was a, a, a tone marker. So uh, something like, uh, not very different. That's the point. It's not very different from uh, modern standard um, Mandarin, something like who. But how is it pronounced back in the old days, in old Chinese? at the time when that first character was used. That's what I'm going to look at now. So, um, so the, the, the first thing we need to discuss then is just how is it possible to understand how old Chinese was pronounced at all? Um, and so um, I'm just gonna take you through the methodology for reconstructing old Chinese very quickly and in a, in, in, in a kind of a bird's eye view. So what do we need? Uh, for a good old Chinese reconstruction, we need whatever pronunciation that uh, the word had in old Chinese to, pre to predict in some sense, the outcome in middle Chinese. You know, you, the, there should be a systematic relationship between the earlier form of the language and the later form of the language. Uh, and also we want uh, our reconstruction, our hypothesis of how uh, the Ch Chinese word was, was pronounced in the old days to explain the use of poetry. So uh, if, you know, if, 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 if that doesn't happen, right, if, if we have a hypothesized pronunciation uh, that, that doesn't lead to um, the rhymes coming out correctly, then that's, a, that's an indication that there's something wrong with our hypothesis. And then also uh, Chinese characters themselves have phonetic information in them. Uh, and, and I will get to that in, in a minute, uh, but you want your reconstruction to be consistent with the information that's in Chinese characters themselves. So I'm just gonna sort of walk us through these three steps with um, the word for tiger. So uh, first the development of old Chinese ah in middle Chinese. So we can distinguish two types of syllables in Old Chinese. I won't be going into any detail about this, but we have type A syllables, which are marked with this, uh, this little symbol uh, in the Baxter and Cigar uh, reconstruction. Um, and those in Middle Chinese are not marked in any orthographic way. Uh, and there are type B syllables, which are unmarked in Old Chinese, but have either start with a Y or have a J in them somewhere in Middle Chinese. Uh, so um, this, so here are the developments. Uh, our type A, A in Old Chinese becomes U in Middle Chinese. Uh, and here are some evidence of that, some early transcriptions. So the word Buddha in Middle Chinese is something like Budu. And now we have good reason to think that this do actually was a da uh, in the old days, right? So um, in old Chinese, it was probably Buddha, we think, which was a pretty good uh, transcription for Buddha, yeah? Uh, but by middle Chinese, it's bu du. Okay, so that's the a ah to u change. And then we also have evidence, and I should say this, this Buddhist evidence is a little late, yeah? It's from the early Han Dynasty. Uh, so it's kind of very late for old Chinese. Uh, but then we also have Sino-Tibetan cognates, which are super, super old, you know, even before old Chinese. Uh, and, and here we have evidence like the word for I, me in Chinese is in middle Chinese, mu, uh, but we think it's something like nga in uh, old Chinese. Why? Because Tibet, in Tibetan it's nga uh, and in Burmese it's nga, etc. cetera. So, um, so I, I hope I've proven to you that uh, a, in old Chinese changes to U. And this also helps explain uh, rhymes in, uh, in poems. So for instance, here we have this poem, uh, Ode 2, 3, 4, stanza 3. We are not rhinoceroses, we are not tigers, 
but we go along those wilds, alas for us men on war service, morning and evening, we have no leisure. So here we have uh, a poem that uses the word tiger in a rhyme position, and we see it's who, and we say, what does it rhyme with? And it rhymes with uh, yeah, and pew, and ha. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm claiming that these all go back to ah uh, in Old Chinese. And now uh, that's it for the vowel, yeah? So how about this initial h? Where does it come from in Old Chinese? Uh, so Middle Chinese h has, has many origins in Old Chinese. Uh, and these include h, m, k, sh, sh, n, and kr. And, uh, and there's a, the, the last four, I should say, are in, uh, in a Western dialect of Old Chinese. So I will go into some of this uh, detail. This is where we need uh, the structure of the Chinese script itself. So we're looking now at eight characters uh, that use the word tiger as an indication of their pronunciation. Um, and yet, you see that in Mill Chinese, there are quite a few different pronunciations here. So, you know, it, if you're looking at it in this way, you say, I can't understand why they write all of these with the same phonetic. Uh, but we hopefully in a few minutes will understand. Uh, and I start with the easy ones. So, you know, it, it, we, we basically I've already covered uh, the vowels. Um, and um, more or less, I'm, I'm just back projecting the more simple initials. So uh, for instance, initial KH was a KH uh, and then P paddleized to CH that you're seeing on the, in, on the fourth one on the, on the left. So this is our sort of first pass at cleaning up the middle Chinese to make sense of this stuff uh, in old Chinese. Um, and then let's see. So now we're going to sort of slightly uh, forget about the ones on the right. Uh, they've we've done what uh, uh, they've done what they're going to do for us. Uh, and then I'll just point out that the real uh, challenge here is this fourth one on on the left because uh, you you have this t that seems totally unconnected. Everything else is. It, you know, it has some kind of ra in it. Uh, so, so how do we uh, deal with that? And uh, Baxter and Cigar's proposal is that you had a little prefix t in this word and then followed by sh. So that's, you know, I'm not uh, claiming that's the, the gospel truth, uh, but that's one solution. And now one thing you're seeing is just how we people who work on old Chinese phonology sort of lead our lives where you identify a problem, like this, and then you're you're you know uh, coming up with proposed solutions, and then you play around and see how good those solutions are. So uh, now it starts to look like the 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 pronunciation in Old Chinese of uh, the word for tiger is sha. Um, and and that. Uh, it came to Middle Chinese via a Western dialect. And I'm basically, you know, what I'm doing there is I'm choosing from among the many options that X could have been in Old Chinese because I'm seeing that all of these uh, uh, characters that use tiger as a phonetic seem to have ra in them. And the only way to have a, a sound like ra and uh, pronunciation with the X in Middle Chinese is to reconstruct sh, a voiceless r. Okay, so so far so good, yeah. Uh, but this is what Baxter and Cigar actually reconstruct. So this is sort of to put it one way, at the end of you know um, uh, a class that I taught on Chinese historical linguistics, this is what I would expect students to do in their homework. 
uh, but this is what the professionals actually do. Uh, and they've got lots of cues in there. And um, uh, Martin uh, uh, will will uh, he'll be very familiar with these cues. They're they're uvular consonants, like ta, ah, like you get in 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 the word for the country Qatar. Yeah. Um, so why did they do this? That's the question uh, that uh, you know I ask myself. And the answer is because of Min dialects. So the Min dialects are uh, spoken in the south. Uh, like Hokkien, which is spoken in Xiamen, uh, and also in Taiwan. And the Min dialects are very conservative. Most uh, Chinese dialects come directly from Middle Chinese, uh, but the Min dialects come directly from Old Chinese. So Baxter and Cigar have looked at the Min dialects, and the Min dialects have Ks. Yeah, so, uh, so Zhen Qian dialect pronounces tiger as Ku. And um, Following a suggestion of Jerry Norman, uh, they think that the way to reconcile these Ks in, uh, in the Min uh, dialect with the evidence of, um, of uh, well, what we've seen so far in, in terms of development to, uh, to an X in Middle Chinese is to reconstruct this uvular consonant, the Q, okay? Uh, but I'll just point out that uh, this is not the only option. You can get Ks uh, other ways. So um, here's a proposal. Uh, and I'm not saying I believe this, but maybe the root of all these words has the shra, and then you had a tight pre-initial in, um, in the third word. So you have this K uh, prefix in front of the shra, and then in the fourth word, you have the T prefix. Uh, and then you have a loose pre-initial. This is using machinery that Baxter and Sagar give us, this loose versus tight pre-initial. So that uh, by this account, the word for tiger would be something like kara. Yeah. So, um, so just to you know, make sure we're all on the same page here, what Baxter and Sagar actually propose is kara. Uh, I actually that's aspirated. I can't, I'm not a phonetician, I'm not so great at these things. Kara. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying is even in their system, I think as far as I can tell, you could also reconstruct kara, yeah? Uh, with the min forms descending from the version with the tight pre-initial. And it's very, very normal. I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm worried that, that some of you will try and you know, catch me out on a methodological error here, but it, it's very normal for some uh, forms of Chinese to, to descend from the, the tight pre-initial form and some from the loose pre-initial form. So here what I'm saying is middle Chinese had a loose pre-initial and then Min had a tight pre-initial. That's, you know, and, and again, I'm not necessarily trying to convince you of this, but I'm saying this is another option that, that as far as I can tell also works. And then it gives you a sense of um, uh, maybe why, uh, or, or sort of how we go about uh, reconstructing old Chinese. But let's look at what Axel Schussler says. Uh, so he's, He's in the kind of same broad camp as Baxter and Cigar, but, but uh, he doesn't agree with them about uh, many things. And he reconstructs a uh, tiger with an L initial. So he says, Hla is the word for tiger. And he points to ancient dialect forms. Those of you who care, these are from the Fanyan, this early uh, sort of book uh, uh, about uh, different dialect pronunciations. So in, in, in this book, they say, okay, here they say tiger this way, here they say tiger this way. And it seems that, you know, I'll point out that tiger was always a, a two syllable word and that the evidence is at least consistent with uh, a reconstruction with an L initial. So uh, that points to, let's all just pronounce them, you know, kalas and kalak and kala and kolok as uh, different dialect pronunciations of tiger. Uh, let's say in the in the late, late Warren States period, early Han, something like that. Okay. And Schussler points out that uh, these, th that his version uh, uh, can help explain connections with words for tiger in other languages. For example, in Angkorian Khmer, the word for tiger is kla, and in Old Burmese, it's kla. So, uh, so you see that, you know, these, these forms, have some kind of ka and some kind of la, so they kind of look like these uh, 
other Southeast Asian forms. Oops. Okay, so now let's look at uh, George Starostin's opinion, and soon you'll just think, you know, in old Chinese, anything goes. Uh, so he says, there is no obvious connection between the regular old Chinese form for tiger, xla, and the above dialect words. He's, he, this is in a book review of Schussler's uh, dictionary, uh, which could easily have been from a duck instead of a hlak. Yeah, so, so Starostin is basically saying that Schussler is uh, too fast to connect these uh, ancient dialect pronunciations to the attested you know, uh, word for tiger that we have today. Maybe those dialects just had a different word for tiger and that that word uh, started with a D rather than with an L. Um, D, L L's in the history of Chinese uh, change into D. Uh, so this is a, a, a possible uh, interpretation. Okay. So now you've seen the different schools of thought on how the word for tiger was pronounced in old Chinese. And now I just uh, want to look uh, at um, some, we're looking now outside of China to the West and to the East. So in, uh, in Japanese, the word for tiger first attested in 702, which is kind of late, but that doesn't mean that the, the word is not old. Uh, you have tora, yeah? And then in Tibetan, uh, the word is stak. Now, maybe tora and stak don't look that similar to you, but they both have a T in them. And it's very normal for G's and R's to have a certain relationship. It's also very normal for A's to change it to O's. So the, the, you could imagine that the, the Japanese comes from something like Taga or Tak. So if Japanese and Tibetan had similar words for tiger, this must be somehow because they both got them from Chinese because you know Japanese and Tibetan were not in direct contact. And also, as far as I know, both countries don't have tigers. So China had tigers, China had a word for tiger, China had a big cultural influence on both of these languages. So we expect then the word uh, for uh, tiger in Chinese to look more like uh, these words. Yeah, and that's uh, something that um, Beckwith and Kiyose point out. So they reconstruct stach as, um, as the word for tiger in old Chinese, which in Baxter and Sugar's system, if you just kind of you know, mutatis mutandis, replace all the symbols, you would get sita. Uh, and I should just mention that Beckwith and Kiyose are kind of out on a limb in terms of their, you know, everything I presented so far is kind of the orthodox school. So sort of uh, the differences of opinion. Yes, there are differences of opinion, but within a certain range, whereas uh, uh, Beckwith and Kiyose are seen as going way out on a limb. So a Chinese form such as ta from la could more or less account for the Tibetan or Japanese forms. Uh, if you see the Tibetan S as reflecting some kind of uh, pre-initial, but we would then need a more secure understanding of the relative chronology of the loss of uvulars. What I'm trying to do here is kind of make them all fit together. So like, can we explain uh, Beckwith and Kiyose's view if we start from Baxter and Cigars, yeah? So uh, we can almost do it, but but there's a lot of loose ends is basically uh, what I would say. And those involve the relative chronology of the loss of youth Hitlers. Uh, we need to know when that happened. We need to know when the loss of voiceless resonance, which are things like sha and sha and na, and also when were the, when were the pre-initials lost. So um, about, uh, the pre-initial in, in Tibetan, which is S, right? Uh, if, if Tibetans wanted to adapt a loan word, and so if we imagine that Chinese had a word like kata, uh, they could have borrowed it as ktak. That's a perfectly legitimate Tibetan word, ktak, but they didn't, they borrowed it as stak. So that suggests that uh, probably uh, the Chinese word wasn't uh, kata, okay? So in other words, the Tibetan word suggests some kind of fricative. Fricatives are things like fa and tha and sha, which make turbulent uh, noise while you speak. So some kind of fricative in the donor. So let's say if we just go, if we assume Tibetan comes from Chinese, we are looking for something like as the form in, in Chinese. Uh, but 
uh, more research is needed. So uh, the reason I chose this topic was, of course, because um, it's the year of the tiger, uh, but also in my 2019 book, uh, when I came across uh, uh, this issue of how to reconstruct the word for tiger, I couldn't do it. So, um, so I am using this opportunity to, to familiarize you with how we go about uh, reconstructing words in uh, Old Chinese. And then you see you know, what kind of materials we have to work with, what kind of methods uh, we use, uh, what kind of hypotheses contend. Uh, but the truth is uh, that uh, when it comes to the word for tiger, at this point, I just have to throw up my hands uh, and thank you for listening. And hopefully, you know, one of you will say, well, you know, it's obvious that, uh, that of those different solutions, uh, this is the one that you should use. So please, you know, tell me, how, how should I reconstruct the word for tiger in old Chinese? Okay. Okay, thank you, yeah. So please join me in thanking Professor Hill. I'm sure that we'll have some questions in the Q&A. Could I just remind people, if you've put your question in the chat, please put it in the Q&A instead. While people are thinking, Professor Hill, can I just ask you, you've mentioned several different stages of Chinese, Old Chinese, Middle Chinese, Modern Chinese, I guess. So in the world of the ancient Near East, when you go from one stage of a language to another stage of the language, it's very often because in the middle, you have sort of a gap or political turbulence. So, you know, you have the Middle Kingdom that speaks Middle Egyptian in Egypt, and then you have an intermediate period, and then you have the New Kingdom that speaks New Egyptian. What happens with Chinese? How sharp are these lines of demarcation? That's a good question. Um, the so, uh, you know, it's a old Chinese, let's say, if we have to assign a date to it, we're aiming for 1250 BC. Uh, and then Middle Chinese is 602. And, and that we can put a sharp, you know, 602, uh, let's call it CE, and that we can put a sharp date on. So, as you can imagine, a lot of politics and uh, famine and population movement and all sorts of things happen in those. Uh, almost 2000 years. So it's, so why do we call that the one old Chinese and the other middle Chinese? It's basically for epistemological reasons. Yeah, which is that um, old Chinese, uh, sorry, middle Chinese 602, that is the first form of Chinese that we can kind of phonologically really sink our teeth into with a sense of security because we have a dictionary that gives us, I don't know, six, 7,000 words and tells us how to pronounce all six or 7,000. So that gives us one kind of epistemological um, firm point to stand on. And uh, then you would say, well, okay, well then why don't you just work slowly backwards from there? And I can't offer anything other than a sociological explanation, which is that the, the the oldest form of a language is the most exciting form <laughs> and the, the most culturally prestigious form. And in particular, the Book of Odes, which is about 350 poems and is from the Zhou dynasty. So kind of not as far back as, as 1250 BC, but in that ballpark um, gives us another, not as firm, but fairly firm uh, piece of phonological information in terms of these Orion poems. Um, and then, as I, I point out, the, the 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 other third sort of leg of Old Chinese reconstruction is the phonetics implied by the structure of the characters themselves. Now, actually, different characters were coined at different times, and and that's a whole philological enterprise. But they were, you know, coined it, many of them as long ago as uh, twelve fifty BC. So, um, so. It, it, there's good reason to think that if you triangulate these three pieces of data, so the, phono the phonology implied by the script, the, 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 the poems, the rhymes in the odes, and what you get where you really know you're on firm footing in 602, we presume that the object reconstructed with those three pieces of information is the Chinese of the, of the Zhou dynasty, if not the Shang dynasty. So kind of, um, you, you, you may well say like, well, you know, that you shouldn't just jump over 
you know, <laughs> 1500 years <laughs> and systematically look at, um, for example, how poetry rhymes during, during that period. And there has been some work in that area, but not nearly as much as there has been on the odes. Uh, I think because it's just less prestigious, less exciting. Uh, but actually, there is a project at SOAS now that I'm involved in that's looking at um, Han Dynasty uh, rhyme behavior. So, you know, I, I, I do think that something that the field needs to do to advance is to kind of clean up that sort of, uh, let's call it 1500 year um, uh, place in between. And, and, and another thing that's, I think, really important in that is these early Buddhist transcriptions, because those are as old as the second century AD. So we can cut sort of, you know, 400 years off and have something that we can fairly firmly stand on. I can't hear you. Oh, yes. One of the few things that most people know about the languages of Asia and Chinese especially is that many of them have tones. Is it known when in this story the tones come into being? Yeah. So uh, I sort of, you know, didn't I sort of brushed over this, uh, but um, the so 602, there are definitely tones. Uh, and in Baxter's system, uh, the uh, I hope I get this right. <laughs> the high tone is written with a capital H and the and the other salient tone, the chusheng, is written with a capital X at the, at the end of the word, right? Um, and then and then the pingsheng, which is the sort of level tone, is unmarked. And then the rusheng, which is the entering tone, is, is, um, is, 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 you know, we linguists wouldn't see as a tone. We would just say it's a stop final uh, syllable. Uh, so those are the four tones of Middle Chinese. And, uh, and, and, it would be a sensible thing to ask, like, well, how are they pronounced or something like that? But we should just understand this is the book itself. The book that we rely on in 602 says there are four tones. These are the four tones. I'm marking the four tones. Yeah. Now, it's clear that the capital H tone was still an S in the early Buddhist transcriptions. So, the t so we can date very precisely that between... 200 and 600 is when the tones uh, were born. And also in that period, I think in the third century is the first time we have people actually discuss the fact that Chinese is tonal. And, you know, it, it could be, you know, random that they had had tones uh, since kingdom come, but it just happens that this is when they were first discussed. But I do think that it's, you know, people, we have a lot of texts from China. So if the first time people discuss uh, tones is in the third century, then it's probably when there were tones was the third century. Thank you. We have a question from Isabella Jackson who says, thank you very much. And do we have more information about animals of the Zodiac like tigers or other culturally significant items? More, like, like are they, do they have less problematic pronunciations? That's a good question. Um, I haven't systematically gone through the animals of the Zodiac uh, because in my book, I was paying attention to words that existed in Tibetan, Burmese and Chinese and tiger, uh, a word that we think is related uh, exists in uh, Tibetan, Burmese and Chinese. Whereas uh, for many of the Zodiac signs, the, um, uh, the words don't seem to be related. And actually, in, in, in many cases, uh, the Chinese word was just borrowed into other languages. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that the word for sheep uh, is pretty securely reconstructed and is yang in old Chinese. Yeah. Uh, the other ones I would have to check. Yeah. Can I ask, how do you imagine people in Japan and people in Tibet? borrowing a word for an animal that doesn't exist in their country and that they've probably never seen. No YouTube, no internet. So when people in Tibet and Japan were using this Chinese word for, word for tiger, what was happening on the cultural level? Did they talk about them a lot? Did they visualize them? Did they have illustrations? How, what happened? I think it was probably something like they adopted the zodiac in order to count years. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the first stab at it I would make but I would say that I mean the same thing happens in in the west right like uh Europeans are super into lions and they didn't have them yeah 
Um, uh, and, you know, not to mention things like dragons, which it's not really clear that anyone had. And I've been thinking a lot, this is a whole nother talk, but I've been thinking a lot about is the European dragon and the, and the Chinese dragon, are they the same animal? You know, that's, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, which I don't know, I don't mean to sort of dismiss the question, but, uh, but I'm saying the, the processes we have for exploring these things methodologically are the same uh, in, in the West as they would be in the East. And we can also see animals, you know, change over time, right? Like, um, like um, uh, the lion uh, on its way from India to Japan turned into a dog, right? Oh, maybe you didn't know that, I guess, yeah. Yeah. So also like, you know, another similar example is there's a male goddess, Avalokiteshvara, uh, who on his way from India to China, I mean, kind of in China, he, he changed into a woman at some point. Yeah. So these things happen. Thank you. And this idea of having um, the traditional Chinese animals associated with the zodiac, how old is that? In China, I have no idea. Actually, there are people on this call who could say better than I do. The um, the like the let's say what I do know is the 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 ten days of the traditional Chinese week goes right back to the beginning, right back, like the very oldest things. And actually, this is something you know we can be very proud of. Is you, you know you may have gotten to writing before us, Martin, but <laughs> the the calendar has been in continuous use since the, since, you know, um, since uh, 1250 BC until today, uh, and in terms of sequence of days. Now, I don't think that they were using the, I, th I think they use renal titles. Actually, like I even saw this um, just yesterday in English uh, documents, they did the same thing. They said, you know, Henry the seventh year five or something like that. So that's how they, uh, dated years in the Shang dynasty. I don't know when they switched to the Zodiac, uh, but I would say that uh, the Tibetans uh, had the Zodiac basically, they also used this kind of renal year system, but they had the, the Zodiac uh, year system basically from the beginning. But from the beginning for them is 650 AD. Yeah. Thank you. There's also a question from Anna Babrenkova, which is, thank you. In Sino-Tibetan historical linguistics, how early on in chronological terms do we expect that the languages or dialects of this family were experiencing any influence from other language families? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to, let's say, I have a whole nother talk about the word for horse. And um, and actually th that one is maybe better because I actually know how the word for horse <laughs> was pronounced in old, old, old Chinese. And uh, and I think, and my co-authors think that uh, that the word for horse is a borrowing from Indo-Aryan, from Proto-Indo-Aryan. Um, and we know that the, the Indo for art on archeological grounds, for instance, the technology of the chariot is a characteristically Indo-European technology that hit China around the time that they got the alphabet. And actually, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll be really scandalous here because I can get away with it since it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> because of the format. I think that they got writing from the, the ancient Near East via the Indo-Aryans. Um, and uh, along with the whole horse and chariot complex. Uh, so that's the, er that's the earliest loan I know of uh, into Chinese. Now, the thing that's hard is like, as you know, the, the Chinese speaking population sort of expanded from, uh, you know, from where it was in, um, in uh, Yinshu uh, to where it is now, uh, and displaced lots of other languages uh, in, in, on that journey, especially Hmong Nian languages, uh, and Austroasiatic languages. Uh, so it seems extremely likely that there are ancient uh, Hmong Mian and Austroasiatic words in Chinese, but uh, the state of Hmong Mian and Austroasiatic linguistics is not super advanced. 
And there are a lot of borrowings in the other direction as well. So sort of weeding apart, you know, who loaned what to who when for things like rice, uh, very difficult. But actually right, rice, actually tea is a good um, candidate. We know tea is from a tibeto burman word for leaf, but it's quite a late loan, yeah. So, um, so I think horse is, is I'm gonna say horse is as old as I'm willing to go. And, and it was already there in 1250 BC. Thank you very much. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. So shall we thank our speaker and draw to a close? Okay, well, thank you everyone for, you know, uh, putting up with uh, what is always technical, you know, linguistics is a kind of technical business. So um, I hope it wasn't too bad. <laughs>